the ultimate part for your digestive system, which is absorption of nutrients. Coming to the small intestine. So food is ingested in the oral cavity firstly. Mechanical and chemical digestion are started and the food is swallowed as a bolus. The bolus then moves through the esophagus by peristalsis to the stomach. In the stomach, specialised gland cells produce hydrogen chloride and pepsin that begin chemical digestion of the proteins. <clears throat> the stomach serves as a temporary food store to continue mechanical digestion for food. The midst of food and digestive juices are called chimes. So I've covered this in the previous videos, yeah? So, so let's look at small intestine now and the absorption of nutrients. The small intestine is a long muscular tube where chemical digestion is completed and 90% of nutrient absorption occurs. The small intestine can be divided into three sections, the duodenum, the jejunum and the ileum. So remember three sections for the small intestine, duodenum, jejunum and ileum. So duodenum firstly, this is the segment of the small intestine closest to the stomach and is 25 centimetres long. Mixing bowl that receives the chyme from the stomach and digestive secretions from the, pan from the pancreas and liver. Moving on to the jejunum. This is the middle segment of the small intestine. It is 2.5 metres long. It is the site of most chemical digestion and nutrient absorption. Look at the duogenum and the jejunum. So now in the final part of the small intestine is the ileum. So this is the final segment of the small intestine. <coughs> it is 3.5 metres long and it ends at the eocable crap valve. Sphincter that is a sphincter that controls flow of material from the ileum into the cecum or the large, in in large in intestine. So, there are three unique features of the, of the mucosa and the submucosa. If you can see here in the wee diagram here, the organisation of the intestinal wall. So you have the mucosa, the muscularis mucosa, the submucosa, muscular layer, and the serosa. And there are three unique features of the mucosa and submucosa, as I said earlier. Circular folds, villi and microvilli. So looking at the small intestine, villi, so the small intestine is covered in hair-like protections called villi. This greatly increases the surface area of the small intestine and each villi contains a capillary bed and a lymphatic capillary called a lateal. So proteins are broken down into amino acids, carbohydrates are broken into simple sugars, lipids are broken down into fats, Amino acids and sugars can be absorbed directly into the bloodstream and the villi, and the fats are absorbed into the lacteal and transferred to the bloodstream via the lymphatic system. So moving on to microvilli, these are apical surface extensions of the plasma membrane of the mucosa's epithelial cells. <coughs> so a combined microscopic appearance gives them the appearance of bristles known as a brush border. Brush border enzymes finish breakdown of carbohydrates and fats. Examples include maltase to glucoamylase, which breaks down products of amylase digestion, to glucose and enteropeptidase, which activates pancreatic trypsinogen. So, looking at the duodenum in more detail, this acts as a mid symbol for chyme and intestinal and pancreatic juices. The gland cells in duodenum secrete intestinal juice. Intestinal juice moistens the time, assists in buffering acids and keeps digestive enzymes and products of digestion in solution. Lipids arrive in the small intestine mostly undigested. Lipid digestion is facilitated by bile and pancreatic enzymes. So, an endocrine gland secretes its products, for example, hormones directly into the blood. An exocrine gland secretes its products, for example, enzymes into ducts that lead to target tissue. And the pancreas is an accessory organ which lies posterior to the stomach. It functions to secrete, to secrete both exocrine and endocrine products. Exocrine digestive enzymes into duodenum and endocrine secreting hormones into the bloodstream. Key hormones include insulin and glucuron from pancreatic islet cells. And just to recap about the endocrine and endocrine glands, an endocrine gland secretes its products, for example, hormones directly into the blood. An exocrine gland secretes its products, for example, enzymes into ducts that lead to target tissue. So, exocrine cells. So these are acinar cells and epithelial cells of the duct system, which secrete alkaline pancreatic juice into the small intestine, about 1000 millilitres per day, and these contain digestive enzymes, waters and ions. These are controlled by hormones from the duodenum.
Pancreatic enzymes are active in the digestion of sugar, proteins, and fats. So let's have a look at some pancreatic enzymes. So you have pancreatic alpha amylase, which is a carbohydrate, and it breaks down certain starches. It is all, almost identical to salivary amylase. You have pancreatic lipase, which breaks down certain complex lipids, and releases products such as fatty acids are easily observe, absorbed. You also have nucleases, which break down RNA or DNA. You have proteolytic enzymes, which break apart proteins. So a protease breaks apart large protein complexes. And peptidases break small peptide chains into individual amino acids. 70% of all pancreatic enzyme production are secreted as inactive proenzymes, and these are activated after speech to the small intestine. Then you have pancreatic enzymes, and these are protein digesting enzymes that are secreted as proenzymes that are then activated in duodenum. So if these were active in the pancreas, they would digest the pancreas. Tripsinogen converted to apsin tripsin in the duodenum. You've got chymotrypsinogen, which is converted to active chymotrypsin by tripsin. You've got procarboxypeptidase, which is converted to active carboxypeptidase by tripsin. Finally, you have proelastase, which is converted to active elastase by tripsin. So let's move on to bio. So bio salts and bio break lipid droplets apart in a process known as emulsification, which occurs in the duodenum. This creates tiny emulsion droplets coated with bile salts. This increases the surface area exposed to enzymes. This is acquired because mechanical digestion in, stomach, in the stomach creates a large droplets of lipids and pancreatic lipids can only interact at the surface. So if any of you had watched my previous liver video, you remember about bile and the function of the liver. So bile is produced in the liver and the liver is the largest visceral organ in the body. This performs essential metabolic and synthesis functions and splits into lobes. It secretes bile into narrow channels, bile ducts from both lobes and goes in a common hepatic bile duct. From common hepatic duct, the bile enters either a bile duct which empties the duodenum or a cystic duct which leads to the gallbladder. This is all occurring in a process of called enterohepatic circulation, which is cycling of bile salts between the liver and the small intestine. So hormones in the small intestine. <laughs> So exocrine secretions on the pancreas and bile production by the liver are controlled by hormones made in the small intestine. Secretin is released when chyme arrives in the duodenum. This increases the secretion of buffers by pancreas and bile by liver. This specifically bicarbonate release by pancreas neutralizes the acid. And this decreases gastric motility and secretory rates by inhibiting gastrin. You also have cholestocystocodin, CCK, which is secreted when the chyme arrives in the duodenum, specifically proteins and fats. This accel accelerates pancreatic production and secretion of digestive enzymes. This relaxes the hepato pancreatic sphincter and contacts gallbladder, ejecting bile and pancreatic juice into the du duodenum. Hormones of the small intestine can also impact the small intestine. So one of these is vasoactive intestinal peptide which is secreted by in, by endocrine cells and simulates secretion of water and electrons by intestinal glands and epithelium and inhibits gastrin release. The alkaline mutus protects the intestinal cells from the acidity of chyme. Then you have enterocrinin which is released when chyme enters the duodenum stimulates al alkaline mutus production by submucosal glands. Look at digestion in small intestine, chemical digestion. Lipid digestion starts in the small intestine with help of pancreatic lipase and bile. The digestion of proteins and carbohydrates is completed with intestinal and pancreatic juices. Almost all the nutrient absorption occurs in the small intestine. Mechanical digestion, sedimentation and peristalsis. Sedimentation, smooth muscle rinse contract and relax, pushing food back and forth to mix with juices and provide time for absorption. The chyme is then slowly moved along the small intestine. The ileocal valve with a sphincter is usually in a constricted state, but when motility in the ileum increases, this sphincter relaxes, allowing food residue to enter the first portion of the large intestine in the system. So we looked at the large intestine, and let's look at the large, so we looked at the small intestine, and let's look at the large intestine. The large intestine, the large bill, was described as horseshoe shaped. It stands from the end of the ileum to the anus lies inferior to the stomach and liver, frames the small intestine, is about 1.5 meters long and 7.5 centimeters wide. Large intestine, you have the cecum, 
which is an expanded pouch, receives and stores material arriving from the helium. And this begins compaction. You have the colon, ascending transverse, descending and sigmoid. It has a larger diameter and thinner wall than small intestine. You have the hosta, which pouches in wall that permit expansion and elongation. You also have the tinea coli, which are free longitudinal bands of smooth muscle, runs along the outer surfaces of colon and muscular layer, and the muscle tone of tinea coli creates a hosta. The other parts include the rectum, which forms 15 centimetres of the digestive tract. Expandable or for temporary storage of feces. You have the anal canal, which is the last portion of the rectum, contains small longitudinal folds known as anal columns. And you have the anus, which is the edge of the anal canal, and it has keratinized epidermis like skin. So major characteristics of the colon include the lack of villi, the instinctive adstentinal glands, the abundance of goblet cells. So mucus on the goblet cells provides lubrication as the fecal material becomes drier and more compact. So the function of the large intestine includes recovers water and electrolytes. So about 1,500 millilitres enter the large intestine, but only about 200 millilitres of feces eliminated. Maintains a resident population of bacteria, the drugged microbiome. Fermentation of some indigestible food matter by bacteria. Formation and storage of feces. And just to talk about bacteria, just there, bacteria do make key vitamins such as vitamin K. Let's now look at the human microbiome. So the human microbiome is composed of microorganisms such as bacteria, archaea, viruses, and eukaryotic microbes. And with skin, mouth, and gut are heavily colonized with microorganisms. The mouth, at least 750 species of aerobic and anaerobic bacteria, methogenic archaea, and yeast are present. Skin, Nearly 20 bacterial phyla, four main groups, fungi, mainly yeast. And the gut, different individuals are highly variable in the bacterial species they have in their gut. So, colonization of the human gut begins at birth. Microbes in the gut affect early development, health, and predisposition to disease. Human gut microorganisms protect against pathogens and produce essential enzymes and amino acids. This is believed to be responsible for the maturing of gastrointestinal tract, educating our immune system and may also play a role in obesity. Let's look at functions of the gut microbiome. So gut microbes are essential to host digestion as they can digest substances we cannot and produce essential nutrients. Gut microbes can ferment indigestible dietary fibres to produce short ch chain fatty acids and these are important energy source for intestinal muc mucosa, help with the absorption of calcium and magnesium, and are critical for modulating immune responses. The gut microbes can synthesize essential host factors such as cofactors, amino acids, vitamins and enzymes. For example, colonic bacteria can endogenously synthesize essential cofactors for host energy metabolism by regulation of gene expression, such as vitamin K, biotin and vitamin B5. So vitamin K is a fat soluble vitamin needed by the liver to make clotin factors. Bacteria make half our daily allowance of vitamin K biotin needed for glucose metabolism. Vitamin B5 is involved in manufacturing steroid hormones and bacteria make all our biotin and vitamin B5. So there's a link between the gut microbiome and obesity as I've done my research. Obesity is a condition of excess body fat and occurs when there's an imbalance of energy input and output. Obesity and obesity related metabolic disorders are characterized by sufficient alterations in the composition and function of the human gut microbiome. A link between obesity and the gut microbiota was initially suggested based on studies in gen free mice. These mice are raised in a sterile environment and have no microorganisms in their gut. Conventionally, reared mice have a higher, 40% higher body fat content and 40% higher gonadal fat content than gen free mice, even though they consume less food than their gen free counterparts. In conclusion, to summarise, <clears throat> the small intestine completes chemical digestion of most food products with the help of secretions from accessory organs such as the pancreas and the liver. The pancreas secretes an alkaline juice with digestive enzymes. The liver produces bile that breaks down lipid droplets to facilitate enzyme de degradation. The small intestine absorbs 90% of the nutrients for food. The large intestine is responsible for recovery of water and electrolytes from the remaining undigested food and compaction of the remaining food for elimination from the body as feces. The presence of bacteria in the gut is very important to help us digest indigestible food matter and for the production of essential products such as vitamins.
composition of bacteria in your gut can have a big impact on your health from predispositions to disease. So that's the end of the digestive system series. I hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, there's lots of it's more exciting topics coming regarding immunology, pathology, etc., microbiology. So keep an eye out for what's coming next. If you've got any suggestions, please do leave some comments underneath. Thank you.